Hello everybody, uh, welcome to uh, the 2020 OR Society Couriers Open Day. Uh, just uh, everyone trickling in as uh, they're joining. Um, just a couple of little bits of uh, housekeeping before we get started. Um, many of you may well be Zoom experts by now. Um, we're gonna be using uh, some of the, the functionality which we'll talk about here. We recommend that you uh, change the settings just to sh show one speaker and move that speaker up into the top right hand corner of, of your screen where you can see the red box on this screen. Um, if you need to uh, send messages to, to any of us, use the chat function. But if you have a particular question for the speakers, uh, do so using the question and answer the Q&A function. Um, under that, there's also the opportunity to uh, vote for questions to give them extra weight to move them to the top of the list. Um, we're going to be having uh, the three presentations, uh, four presentations, sorry, and then the, the question and answer session after that. So a series of short presentations uh, and then the, um, then the Q&A. Okay, um, so just to run through uh, today's setup, we have three sessions, each of an hour and a half, starting at 10, 12 noon and 2.30. And you can see the uh, speakers in each of those on the screen in front of you. So hopefully you've signed up for all three sessions. Um, the videos from all of this uh, will be available shortly afterwards uh, and we'll let you know when when they're up and running okay um let's get moving we've got a tight time schedule um our first speakers are my two colleagues uh, from the OR society amy hughes and evelyn hardy um, amy is the pro bono uh, or manager for us and eve is our education officer uh, i'll leave them to say more over to you guys Thanks, Gavin. Um, so, yeah, welcome, everybody. And just before we hand you over to our wonderful exhibitors today, we just wanted to briefly talk to you a little bit about the OR Society and the different things that we can do that help students like yourselves when you're job hunting. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about before we get really stuck in is I just wanted to show you the sheer breadth of careers in operational research. So these logos are not um, necessarily companies endorsed by ourselves and they're not the only people that recruit people in operational research, but hopefully the household names and the variety of sectors just show you that operational research isn't just one job, it's a whole field of jobs. Um, and within that whole field of jobs, there are also lots of job titles. So as education officer, I chat quite a lot to students looking for roles in OR, and it can sometimes be a little bit tricky to find them. So this word cloud just shows the job titles of members in our LinkedIn group. It's just a random sample. And the bigger the job title, the more popular it was in our members. So it really just shows that I think the advice I would give to yourselves, I'm not sure what advice our exhibitors have, but don't just look for operational research, also look for, I don't know, business development analyst, data scientist, um, analytics manager, data consultant, 
there's lots and lots of job roles within OR that might at first glance not look like OR. So yeah, keep your eyes peeled. Um, and as I said, the OR Society is here to help you with a lot of that. So for those of you who haven't had much interaction with us before, we are the membership body for people who work in or study operational research. There's a number of different things that we do specifically to help student members. So we can help you to enhance your CV. We can help you by offering accreditation schemes and volunteering opportunities. We can also help you to access funding like our master's scholarship or discount rates to our training courses. We can help you to connect with other members of the OR Society, whether that's potential employers or people in the same boat as you. And we can also help you to know what's going on in the world of operational research or what you might like to do in that with access to our magazines and journals. So um, I'll take you through those in a little bit more depth now. But first things first, you absolutely should join us as student members. Student membership is completely free. So there's no reason for you to not join. Um, it's really easy to do. Just visit any page on our website and click the join button in the top left next to our logo. And for anybody who might be graduating soon and thinking, well, it's not really worth me joining as a student member. Everyone who joins as a student and then transitions into paid membership gets access to a kind of secret rate that you won't find on our website. That's just one pound a month for membership rather than the usual eight or nine pounds a month. So it really is worth your while just taking two minutes today to sign up and access all the different ways that we can help you. Um, and one of the ways that we can help is through our uh, special interest groups and regional societies. These are smaller groups inside the OR society and they can be really beneficial for students. So we've got people here today from across the country and you can join your regional local society and that helps you to network with people in your area and also find out who is employing people in OR roles near you. We've also got a number of special interest groups. They let you network with people um, who've got your shared interest in a really niche area of OR, whether that's analytics or defense, but the, and loads more, uh, but the special interest group that's usually of most interest to students is our early careers network. So this network consists of people who want to help you establish your career in OR and other people who are looking to establish their career. So this special interest group does a number of things like offering one-to-one -one mentoring. They can give you careers help and advice with your CV. They also run networking events and they run professional development events and help keep you up to date with everything in OR and new OR techniques. So members of the OR Society can join this Early Careers Network and that's a really beneficial thing for students to do. Um, the other thing we can offer students that's usually very popular is our Master's Scholarship. So we are currently accepting applications for people starting a Master's degree in September next year and we will pay up to £10,000 towards your degree as long as you are a UK national studying an, a degree that has at least 40% OR. So if you are thinking about maybe delaying starting a career slightly and doing a bit of further study, this is a really good opportunity for you to get a bit of help doing that. And I'd strongly encourage you to visit the link at the bottom and check it out. Um, and as I mentioned, we can help you to enhance your CV. So we can do that in two different ways. The first one is through accreditation. So we have a professional accreditation scheme that you can apply for the first level of as students, which is the candidate associate. That enables you to put the letters candors after your name. And it really helps you to stand out when you're applying for jobs because it demonstrates you've got a really strong commitment to operational research and a career in this space. And as you can see from the slide, that careers, um, 
sorry, accreditation ladder runs all the way through to being a fellow of the OR Society, which signifies you've got over 10 years experience in the field and you're an expert. We also recognise and endorse um, accreditations such as the Registered and Chartered Scientist, which are ran by the UK Science Council. And the other way we can help you to enhance your CV is through volunteering opportunities. So um, I run our education outreach program and I am always looking for more people to help us. So we visit schools and universities and we talk to students about OR, about the careers in OR and really just open their eyes to this field. And if you'd like to get involved and help out, we can do things like visit a school for an afternoon and run a workshop with Lego. It's a really fun way to give back to your community and it also helps you to develop your communication and presentation skills. And again, it looks great on your CV and demonstrates that commitment to OR. Um, I'm going to hand you now to Amy, my colleague who works in Pro Bono, and she's going to talk to you about Pro Bono OR. Hello, yes. Um, so my name's Amy and I'm the Pro Bono OR Manager at the OR Society. Um, our Pro Bono OR scheme um, connects OR Society volunteers with good causes, basically. So our volunteers donate their time and skills to help charities facing difficult decisions or looking for improvement. Um, we run the scheme as we want more organisations to benefit from uh, OR as well as providing our members with opportunity to gain work in a different sector, um, but also to gain consultancy experience as well, which is great for CVs and for moving up um, the career ladder. Um, for more information on the scheme and how you can volunteer, um, you can, and you can also look at case studies as well on our website um, under the Get Involved tab and click on Pro Bono. Um, so, as a society, we also run a number of events throughout the year. Obviously, Careers Open Day is one of these, um, but we also have numerous other events. Um, you can find a full list of these on our website uh, under the events tab. Um, I'm just gonna touch on a few here that are just perfect for those in their early career. Um, so normally our events take place in person. Obviously this year has meant things have been done online, um, which is great for you guys because it means you can attend from the comfort of your own home. Um, we run two free lectures a year. Um, the next one being the Blackett Lecture, which is in about a week's time. Um, and this is an might be of interest to you as this year's speaker is MP Chris Gidmore, who is the former Minister of State for Universities. Um, and his talk is on OR in the 21st century, um, how OR has been used to shape public behaviour, and also what the future of OR is. Um, so I think it's a great opportunity for some of you to go along, ask some interesting questions, as being in your early career, you are that future of OR that he's referring to. Um, the next event is the Analytic Summit. Um, it's at a discounted rate for our members and student members. Um, and that's where we showcase the newest developments in artificial intelligence, OR, analytics, data science. Um, but it's also a great place to network um, with those in the business as the majority of our attendees there are heads of analytics departments um, at big organizations that are both UK and global. Um, and then finally, we've got our biggest event, which is the uh, annual conference. Um, it's a multi-stream event and it attracts hundreds of attendees from all over the globe. Um, so hopefully you will join us for that in September with your student membership discount. Um, in terms of personal development um, for our members, we offer training courses um, that run throughout the year and they cover sort of all aspects and areas of OR. Um, and as you can see, um, student members get a 25% discount on those. Um, our newest training guide can be downloaded from uh, the ORS website, um, and that contains complete information on every course we offer. Um, training course is obviously a great way to help you stand out on your CV, um, but also to expand your knowledge and proficiency in essential skill sets, especially if you're not going on to do further study. Um, and then finally, the OR Society um, also publishes a number of learned journals and also magazines. These are all uh, online for free for our members. Um, you may have come across some of these journals um, at university if you did a heavily OR degree, um, but they're also incredible resources throughout your career, not just when you're studying for a degree. Um, and magazines, on the other hand, are a little bit more OR light, if you like. Um, Inside OR uh, is more, it contains news, um, current developments in OR, 
for community events that you might be interested in, um, as well as awards and prizes that are available in different fields. And then we have Impact Magazine, which is packed with real world examples of OR and how OR and analytics are used to make better decisions. So do make sure to have a look through um, some of those on our website and they're under the publications tab. So yeah, uh, please do get in touch. We want to hear from you. We want you to get involved and also benefit from the resources and networking opportunities that we have, um, many of which are free with the free student membership. So thank you for listening. And I'm going to hand you uh, back over to Gavin to introduce our first exhibitor. Great, thanks uh, Eve and Amy, that's uh, lots of uh, interesting information there. Um, before I introduce our first uh, exhibitor, uh, let me just remind you, if you have questions for Amy or Eve or, or any of the, the three exhibitors that we're gonna cover this, this in this first session, please submit them through the, the Q&A function, which you can see at the bottom of your screen uh, if, you, if you hover your mouse over that. So, uh, do submit those so that we can feed them to the uh, panelists at the end of this, towards the end of this session. Okay, uh, first talk that we have lined up for you uh, is uh, Jason Potter and Dan Morris from BAE Corda. Uh, Corda is part of BAE Systems and it's a modeling and analytical consultancy with over 35 years of experience of helping UK government uh, and industry more widely to make informed decisions in complex environments. Uh, Jason and Dan are just two of the team of 40, over 40 consultants who are primarily based uh, in Hampshire uh, and they're at the centre of excellence for modelling and analysis in BA systems, uh, providing support to the rest of their organisation and to external customers. Okay, so over to uh, Jason and Dan. Thanks, Gavin. Just share my screens now. Can you see my screen as I'm presenting? Just to double check. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Thanks very much. So thanks for that introduction, Gavin. That was probably better than uh, what we were going to do. So really appreciate that. So hi, everyone, and welcome to our 10 minute talk. So we are here from Corda, which is the analytical consultancy within BAE Systems. So um, I believe you can see me here on the right. Um, it's not the best photo, but it's taken from a video at the OR Careers Fair. Um, no, sorry, not the OR Careers Fair, the OR Young to OR event last year. So I have been with Corda for two and a half years now. I completed a master's in OR at the University of Southampton and first came across OR during my placement year as an undergrad. I'm joined today by my colleague Dan. Morning everybody. So you're probably thinking um, that's a bit of an odd photo that I've got on the left and it's in fact me at the last OR Society Careers Fair um, two years ago where I in fact met Jason. Um, he told me about Corda and since then um, I'm working there and I've been there for 18 months. A bit about me, um, I studied at the University of Leicester and came across OR um, in a module that I found and I was really interested and decided to explore a bit more about it. So in a rough overview, who are BA Systems? So BAE is a large British defence organisation with many sites around the country and internationally. We have roughly 35,000 employees in the UK, reaching about 80,000 worldwide. Our biggest customer in the UK is the MOD, for which we are involved with all of the different branches of the military, as well as cyber security teams and DSTL. The work that BA System does is impactful and it's important and interesting. Being a part of Corda, we get to experience the whole breadth of the organisation and be part of a lot of different areas from within it. So I think Gavin did a pretty spot on job of um, introducing who we are, but um, I'll add a few things. So like we said, we're a consultancy team based in um, Hampshire, specifically Farnborough, but we've also got a couple of people in Preston in the north. 
um, and we provide analysis and modeling to help customers make better informed decisions. Um, a lot of our work is done internally within BA systems. So if they have a, a problem they need solving or something they'd like to explore, we're often the first port of call. We do a lot of external work as well. So we largely help the UK government and other industry customers, for example, in the areas of defense, transport, counterterrorism, and security sectors. And our work is project-based, so it's very varied, interesting, challenging. It's never boring, and you'll often find you're doing many different things. Um, um, you may be doing something for six months, or you may be doing something for two weeks. Really, really interesting, really varied. And you can shape your career based on what projects you're interested in, whether that's data insights, performance insights, business insights, or defense analysis. And we always use the right software for the appropriate job. So initially when I joined Corda, I had some experience, a very basic experience in Excel and R. And um, since then I've been trained up in Alteryx and Tableau and they've in fact expanded upon my skills in Excel for Visual Basic. I will add here as well that the, the photos in this pack are actually Corda members taken in our office because they do look a bit like stock photos. However, for obvious reasons, we're, uh, we're not actually in the office at the moment. However, we've all been able to uh, work at home effectively still this year, utilising tools such as Zoom and WebEx. So I thought so what the best thing to show would probably be what we've done so far in our time at Corders, as both Dan and myself are still relatively within early careers, I'd say. So um, I have supported and travelled for a number of projects at different BAE and MOD sites, including Portsmouth Naval Base, which I think is the photo bottom middle, um, Wharton Aerodrome, RAF Marham, which is in Norfolk, and Joint Forces HQ on London. And this has been for a wide variety of different work. And when I'm doing things like this, I would normally work in the office as part of a team, but then I would travel to the location and support customers there, which may often be for weeks at a time. And for a number of these, I have been entrusted to act as the project manager. And this is including for a piece of work on Type 45 destroyers and another with F-35 aircraft. I've also been lucky to have the opportunity to attend hackathons and in the London and the North, as well as conferences, such as those run by the OR Society. So um, a little bit about me, I've largely been doing work within the data insights um, area. The last year I've been working in the HR analytics team, providing people data to business leads within the company. Um, so for example, I've recently been looking into movement of employees to see if they're moving by business, function, country. And that's to ensure really that our employees are getting the right experience to expand their career. Um, like Jason said, due to the COVID pandemic, things have changed, I think, every, you know, how everyone works. And I've been doing a bit of work exploring how the pandemic has affected the business and employees specifically, seeing how productive certain areas are and if there's anything else we can do to help improve the situation. Um, additionally, on the side, I've done some work into a employee app and doing some analysis into that that was rolled out um, in the beginning of the year, seeing how successful it is by measuring the engagement, um, how many people have set alike, stuff like that. Um, and I've done a little bit on health and safety in the workplace and regarding future prospects, next year I'll be doing some work regarding the Type 26 naval ship, looking into some logistics. So um, that's enough about us, uh, but here is uh, what we're offering. We're looking for our next group of graduates to be joining us in September next year. I will say, however, that uh, we do recruit at intervals throughout the year as well, as you can find, and you can find this um, hopefully in this, in this pack, which will be emailed out to you. Um, and it's got a link of our current job listings as well. So I think a great thing about our graduate programme is that you'll find that you're involved and in doing project work from day one. However, after six months, you'll likely be doing something completely different at the other end of the spectrum. We encourage everyone to explore working in different areas, but also giving them the opportunity to tailor their own skills and development to areas that they're most interested in. So I'm really interested in data manipulation. So I have an opportunity to say, I want to be involved with this project and if time allows, I normally get on the projects that I want to do, which is fantastic. 
And something else I really like about um, this role is the ability to actually use what you've used at university um, to solve real world problems. We're always keen to use technical methods and learn about more methods and where we appreciate that everyone can bring something new to the table and has their own ideas about finding a solution. In Corda, we have the freedom to solve our problems using whichever methods we prefer. Just, I wanted to add as well, if you, if you look at the photos on the top right, that is, like Jason said, people who actually work at Corda and we're in fact a very social team. You know, We are a team of 40, which is quite large, but it's also not so, it's not so large that we don't know everybody. You know, we all like to talk to each other. We all have interests that we share. There's a squash club that we have, a running club. Um, and we, because of COVID, we've had to adapt and have a Strava club. So we're a very welcoming team. Yeah, the, the Strava Club is a very competitive though. It's got a leaderboard. And, yeah, it's, um, it's, yeah. It's, I think we're, we're still definitely keeping that that connection between us. Um, as Dan said, we're, we're small enough that we know each other and we've got games on Fridays and we try and do other things during the week as well to kind of keep that team connection. And the, the, we're large enough that there's always someone there that can understand and support. There are many opportunities from it, this role that um, often to travel and even internationally obviously again COVID permitting at this time but next summer I think will be great opportunities there. Let's hope so. Um, so right what we're looking for we're looking for um, people who have a degree or master's or PhD in a numerate subject with a grade of 2-2 or above. You've got to have strong analytical skills and be able to apply these techniques that you've learned at university to real life problems. You've got to be comfortable working on your own as well as in a team and you'll be, have, you'll be talking to a variety of customers, so you need to be able to have good communication and interpersonal skills. You'll often be managing your own time, managing your own projects as well, so you need to be able to prioritise tasks where you need to. And you've got to be a problem solver, self-motivated and driven, someone who wants to step up to any challenge to help do meaningful and rewarding work. So, um, I see we've got to have some things in the Q&As, but I just wanted to add, um, if you are interested, we have a Corda website. Um, it's the link at the bottom. You can search for basystems.com graduates to find out about the roles. And if you'd like to connect with either Jason or I, we have our email addresses as well as our LinkedIn addresses. Yeah, I just want to say actually, thank you for the three people who seem to have buzzed my phone and added me on LinkedIn during this call. That's that's really great to see kind of the motivation certainly from people behind the scenes here. So thank you very much for that. But uh, yes, any questions, feel free to ping us either on those links um, in the Q&A session on Thursday, which I believe we're taking part in as well as have a look on our website. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Jason and Dan. Um, thanks everybody who is both submitting the Q&A, the questions for the session at the end. There are a number of those. And I see you've also found how to upvote and rank your favourite questions if some of the things you want to know have already been asked. Uh, so we'll come to that shortly. Uh, in the meantime, we'll move on to our uh, second speaker. Uh, Cosmin Ududek is the Managing Director and Head of Research at Invenia Labs. His background is in mathematical physics uh, and in particular the foundations of quantum mechanics and in quantum information theory. Uh, for the last five years he's been leading the research team uh, at Invenia in, in Cambridge in the UK. Uh, and Invenia use machine learning to optimize electrical grids, uh, which improves grid economy and environmental efficiency. And hopefully I haven't stolen too much of your thunder. Over to you, Cosmin. That's all right. Hi, everyone. Uh, and thank you very much for the nice introduction, Gavin. Uh, let me just share my screen here. Um, there we go. Okay, so uh, yeah, my name is Cosmin Nurdedek, and uh, I'll be talking about some of the work that we do at Invenia and Invenia Labs. Um, as Gavin mentioned, my background is, one sec, there we go. Uh, my background uh, started out in uh, mathematical physics, quantum foundations, quantum information theory, and over time I've made a switch into machine learning, optimization theory, and um, 
I'm very interested in applying these kinds of modern techniques and tools to, to improving uh, the efficiency of electricity grids and more broadly optimizing uh, processes and aspects that are aspects of the of uh, of society that that are obviously really important for for its for its functioning and for the quality of life of everyone uh, and I think there's a huge scope for using these kinds of tools um, from really basic theoretical research in AI and machine learning to improve these kinds of systems and I think we'll be seeing a lot of that uh, which is partly why I'm so interested in these areas and so as Gavin mentioned as well I've um, for the last five years, I've been the chief science officer at Invenia. And the kinds of things that I do day to day, I work on our research strategy, uh, planning, all kinds of things like that, and the uh, leading the research team, which is currently 23 people, which I'll get into a little bit later. Um, so what we're focused on is essentially our mission is to optimize electricity grids by using modern machine learning, modern data science, optimization, power systems theory. So all of these sort of very academic theoretical tools, we're trying to apply them uh, to have an impact on grid economic and environmental efficiency. So one of, the, one of the reasons why we think this is so important is that electricity grids produce, I think something like 20% of CO2 emissions through the, through the emissions of gas and coal plants. And we're currently going through a revolution of integrating renewables and batteries and all kinds of other things into electricity grids. So there's a huge scope for, for improving these systems uh, over, the next, over the next decades. So a little bit about electricity grids, uh, just to give you a sort of a, a flavor of the kinds of problems that are faced. Um, you can see on the plot here, uh, the y-axis is sort of a spatial scale and the x-axis is sort of a temporal scale. And there are various kinds of the physical systems or the infrastructure, the actual power grid, the plants, you can see the little bubbles, roughly the scale that they exist at in time and space. And there are all of these different operational considerations, organizational and policy considerations, all of the way from the bottom left, which are smart meters to the top right, which is a global climate policy and everything in between. And what we're particularly focused on are the sort of the stuff in the middle, right? So intraday, day ahead capacity. So this is sort of the operation of the grid day to day. And when I talk about uh, economic and environmental efficiency, it's the efficiency of these processes. Um, so because the grid is so large, essentially continent scale system, um, and it has all of these relevant time scales, um, it introduces a lot of complexity. There are thousands of uh, power plants of different, all kinds of different sizes. Uh, there are all kinds of nonlinear relationships between the environment and human actors. So how the power plants behave, how consumers behave. Um, the data that we deal with is often limited in, in various ways and is very, very high dimensional. So if you imagine that a grid might have hundreds of thousands of power lines, uh, tens of thousands of generators, um, that's the sense in which I mean high dimensional. And as I mentioned, the grids are changing very fast uh, because of the integration of renewables and batteries and everything else. And the situation we're in now is that many of these processes, especially on the operation side, are still largely human driven. While there are various automated systems uh, in the sense of forecasting and optimization and decision making, there's still a lot of heuristics which have, can have non-obvious side effects um, and can be inefficient in various ways. So where we interact with grids um, is through organizations called system operators which essentially control the grid day to day. So you can see in this diagram that utilities sort of own and operate the grid. So power plants turn on when they're needed. Um, and um, there are various organizations that own the power lines and so on. Uh, the system operators um, sort of organize all of this information and make plans for the next day and run things in real time. So they interact very heavily with utilities um, in, in, in controlling the amount of power that is, that is produced and sending the right signals to utilities. And the key aspect that we're most interested in is day ahead planning, where um, the idea is that in order to have an efficient grid in real time, you need to plan ahead. And the better that plan is, the better the operation will be in real time. And in order to do this effectively, we require uh, sometimes complex 
uh, probabilistic models and simulations for things like load generation and prices. And so our work is essentially focused on building such models and improving them, and then using them to make decisions about the operations of, of the generators. So that's just a really, really quick introduction to the kinds of problems that we're facing, just to give you a sense of the, the scope. Uh, now on our research team, we currently have, I think about 23 people with very different backgrounds and specialties. Um, some of them are physicists, some of them have more of an operations research background, some of them are uh, engineering, um, some of them are for, from computational fields, uh, computer science degrees, all kinds of different backgrounds. So right now we have eight machine learning specialists, and the kind of work that they do is designing, implementing, testing various models, forecasting and decision-making models um, to really high standards. We have a couple of data scientists whose focus is on understanding and connecting various of these complex data sources. So very often the, the most value from, from some data sources, it comes from when we combine them together effectively. So the, the, the sum is greater than the, than the parts. Um, and our data science are also very focused on diagnosing events in the grids. So sometimes, you know, there's a hurricane and the grid behaves in a strange way or something goes wrong and we wanna understand these such that we can forecast things better and, and mitigate those, the bad effects of those events. Um, we also have a fairly large team of research software engineers and they have very different backgrounds. Some uh, have actually come from operations research and physics. Um, some have a more traditional computer science background and their sort of mission is to build the tools that researchers need right before they need them. So we're very focused on, on building our internal systems and tools such that we can uh, more efficiently design and implement um, various kinds of models. And the, the last specialty is a power systems uh, group uh, who, who have a, a good understanding of how the grids behave, the optimizations involved, um, all of the sort of power systems tools that we need to improve our machine learning models. So our, our whole research team is very interdisciplinary. We work on projects very often with one or two people from each of these specialties. Um, we find that the, the best projects require all of these different skills to work well together. And we're very focused in particular on using expert background knowledge from our power systems team and from our data scientists to structure our machine learning models and to, to improve uh, the efficiency with which they can forecast, with which they can train and so on. So there's a lot of text on this slide, I won't go through it, but this is just to give you an example of some internship projects that we've had in the past. Um, so you can, you can take a look at the projects here, they're, they're very different. Some are very focused on modern machine learning forecasting models like Gaussian processes, if you're familiar with those. Uh, some of them are very focused on understanding prices of electricity uh, and in particular the spikes when something goes wrong in the grid. And other projects are very focused on improving uh, the something called optimal power flow, which is the a central aspect of the day ahead planning that I mentioned earlier. And so reducing the computational costs, improving the outputs of these optimizations that the system operators run every day. So we have all kinds of projects like this. Uh, we've had internships from stemming from three months to, to a full year in the past. And in terms of our day-to-day -day projects, they sort of have the same kind of flavor as these. So in terms of our application process in hiring, um, we have a very structured and very selective hiring process, both for internships and for full-time positions. And if you want to get a better sense of the what we look for, the requirements of the positions, um, take a look at our, at our jobs website. Um, and these will vary depending on the, on the role. So we're currently hiring for all four of those research positions that I mentioned. And there's also other opportunities as well that you can find on the website. Uh, one thing I think is worth mentioning is that as part of our interview process, we'll often do a take home exercise, which we try to make sort of interesting and fun uh, for the applicant. And this will may involve reading a paper uh, solving some problems, writing some code, analyzing some data, things like that. Um, so almost all of our interviews have that as part of the process. Um, so that's, that's about it for me. Um, thank you very much. Great, thanks.
Cosmin. Okay. Um, okay, back to our schedule. Um, lots of questions coming in, lots of upvoting. Thanks for that. To uh, keep them coming, we'll be coming to them shortly. Uh, okay, the third uh, of our exhibitors in this session before we get on to the Q&A is Hartley McMaster. Um, so let me introduce Martin Slaughter. Uh, Martin's uh, worked in, over, in OR for over 40 years uh, and has been with Hartley McMaster for uh, 30 of those years, a uh, company that he set up with his wife. Um, so Martin's got a wealth of experience in, in seeing OR applied to uh, real world problems in lots of different sectors. Uh, so over to you, Martin. Okay, uh, thanks, Gavin. I'm just starting my stopwatch because I'm never knowingly uh, on time, but let's uh, let's give it a whirl. Come on. Here we go. Oh, come on. Right. Try and do the first bit quite quickly. Company. Well, we're an analytical consultancy, so. All we do is analytical work. Um, anything that you'd see as part of uh, a typical OR course in terms of techniques, anything really in terms of sectors, we cover that. We just don't do other stuff, purely analytical consultancy. We're based in St Albans, which is about 30 miles north of central London. Uh, I think the tourist guide wouldn't thank me for saying it's where the M1 meets the M25, but it is actually a very, very nice place to live and work. As Gavin said, founded, uh, well, actually 29 years ago, coming up to our 30th anniversary uh, by myself and my wife. Uh, since then, we've recruited, we've grown, and I think we actually do have a good, uh, strong reputation in the OR community for what we do. So what do we mean by analytical consultancy? Well, to be honest, we use a very wide range of techniques. As I say, anything that you're likely to have seen in your course, we will have used at some point for a study. Um, anything that the OR Society offers a course in, we've probably used it at some point. Don't necessarily use everything at the same time, but it's um, the right technique for each project. The bias is probably more towards quantitative methods rather than qualitative, but not exclusively so. And yet we use a very wide range of tools. That's usually dictated by what our clients want us to use because it's their in-house preference, but we do have our own preferences as well. Um, when I'm asked by people, so what is it you do? I say useful sums, usually on computers. And I think that sums up pretty much what we do. Who do we do it for? Well, we do it for a very wide range of clients. Um, uh, certainly, we do a lot of work in the public sector uh, for uh, government departments. We've probably worked for pretty much every government department at some point. Uh, we have done a lot of work recently for DEFRA, for Ministry of Justice, Department for Transport, but we have worked for pretty much everyone in government at some stage. Occasionally for local authorities as well, but primarily for central government, and increasingly we're doing work for the health service now. Um, we also have a lot of clients in the private sector. Um, a lot of that has been focused over recent years on the utility companies, that's water companies, electricity companies, etc. But we've also worked for a large number of what you'd see as the uh, blue chip sort of multinational companies. We've done a lot of work for British Airways. We've done a lot of work for Vodafone, uh, for Reuters, people like that. And uh, at the moment, we're also doing quite a lot of work for engineering companies in the transport and environmental sectors. But on top of that, we have also worked for a number of major charities. And indeed, one of the examples I've got a little later on is for the RNLI, who we've uh, done work for. Our staff, um, well, uh, I think you'll probably hear this an awful lot uh, over the course of the day, but what we do is team-based and project-based. Um, project really, it naturally flows out of the fact we're a consultancy our external clients will come and they'll have a particular problem they want us to look on, look at. That's inevitably going to be a project. The size of the task that we look at means in almost inevitably a team of people. Often 
Um, often I would have thought one or two or three people in that team. The largest sort of team that we'd have probably would be heading towards 10, but that's the sort of size. Again, variable lengths of projects. We have some that are, are a, a week. We have some that are 12 months, typically three months, I would have said on average. Um, again, Pre-COVID, uh, the work would be split between work on client site and in the company office. That's really down to what the client wants. Um, in some cases, they're keen for us to be there and it works well. Sometimes for space reasons or whatever, they're happy for us to work in our office. Obviously at the moment, it's neither of those, it's working from home. Wide range of tools, um, I could list them, I don't think need to. Again, we're, we're, we're tool agnostic. It's a question of what's the best tool for the job rather than having specific ones that we would always recommend. Um, where are our clients? Uh, government, when we're working for them and many of the multinationals, it's often in London, almost invariably in the UK, but we do occasionally have projects in Europe, very occasionally in North America, and we do now have an affiliate office in Hong Kong. So one of my colleagues was out in Hong Kong at the start of the year. That is actually very rare for us. So there is a potential need to work away from home on occasions, something I think is fair to sort of flag up that consultancy work, certainly uh, our, with our type of work, does require a willingness to be flexible and, and an ability to be flexible. Graduate recruitment has been something that's been absolutely core to what we do over the years. We look for people with numerate degrees. We have economists, we have mathematicians. I'm a physicist myself. Um, we have had people with joint honours, maths, computer science, those sorts of things, but we need to have a really strong numerate element to it. Um, first thing that happens is that we assess people to make sure that they've got the right skill set to start work directly with our clients. For some people that takes a little while because they've actually got a lot of the relevant skills. For others it'll take longer, but that's fine. We tailor what happens in that first stage of uh, recruitment and training to what the individual needs. But we're also keen that once people are ready, and that can be quickly, um, they get involved directly in work. I think that's good for them, it's interesting for them, and it's certainly something that we want to do. We continue to invest in training to develop skills, some of it proactive at, to develop a person to make them ready for uh, an area they want to move into, some of it reactive uh, because we need specific skills topping up for a particular project. We mentor our staff, we manage our staff, but we try to make it fun and interesting as well. And I think we've succeeded in that. It is fair to say at this stage that COVID-19 has and will impact our 2021 recruitment plans and timetable. Normally, we would be looking to start things very much now um, with interviews potentially before Christmas uh, and then arranging for people to start really as soon as they can after completing their degrees, etc. Because we want to invest time in that first phase of uh, training, we don't know when we're going to be in a position to do that properly. And therefore, things are on hold at the moment. What we would ask people to do is, if they're interested in us, submit a CV and a covering letter, and we'll keep you posted on how we're doing uh, and when we'll be able to uh, uh, move things forward. I'm running out of time already. Some, some typical projects. One I'm working on at the moment with some of my colleagues, two of my colleagues, we're doing a lot of work for the Waste and Recycling Action Programme. Uh, they themselves do a lot of work for DEFRA in central government, but they also work for local authorities and engineering firms. And we're helping them build uh, and revise and extend a lot of their, uh, uh, their models. Um, work in this case, largely in Excel and VBA, though there is some data analysis where we've used other tools. Our Python type stuff. Uh, the assignments we've had with RAP have been recently over this year either fairly short around about the five day mark and the larger ones have been a couple of months. Uh, one that we've completed uh, not this year but uh, fairly recently for our NLI. They asked us to have a look at what are the factors behind unsuccessful searches. So they've sent, they've sent a lifeboat out um, for various reasons it's been unsuccessful, why would that be? 
And this is a case where we were given a large number of the fairly badly structured reports that are filled in by crews and told, see what you can find in it. So in this case, it was largely a sort of data science textual analysis type job. Um, we had to, for a start, work out what the definition of unsuccessful was, um, because that was far from clear. And in fact, that was one of the key things that came out of the project that the RNLI was particularly interested in having a, a clear definition of unsuccessful. Um, we worked with a large amount of data. We used a range of, again, statistical analysis tools. And at the end of it, we ranked the factors which uh, we felt had the most impact on unsuccessful searches, which RNLI can then use to prioritize their own research into equipment, into training methods, et cetera, et cetera. Um, at the moment, we're also doing a large model migration project for DEFRA. Um, obviously, central government client. What they have is a large Excel VBA model, but government wants to move things very much into the R, R shiny Python world. And so we're disassembling their existing model, rebuilding it as an R, R shiny model. This is actually quite a large undertaking. So we've got five people maximum uh, working on the project, two at the start, five maximum, and then uh, it's gonna drop down. Um, both of our two most recent graduates uh, worked on this partly because uh, our shiny is something that is actually more familiar to them than some of the old lags like myself. Um, the uh, work would have been on the DEFRA site in Westminster before COVID struck. Uh, now, again, it's something that where people have done it primarily working from home. This one is a six month duration project. And uh, I think I've already run out of time or overrun. So thank you very much. Happy to take questions. No, you are fine to finish if you if you want to. Well, I've got one more, but no, I, I, I feel I would be stealing time there. I was going to talk, we've also been doing some transport modeling. He said stealing that time um, for uh, an engineering company who do a lot of work for uh, DFT, Department for Transport, Highways England, other people like that. And in this case, we've been rewriting some of their models uh, using C sharp. Uh, we've even had another one where we there was a, a bug in the model that uh, they couldn't find. So we were asked to pick it up. That one, I, being so old, actually really worked because it was a Fortran model. Um, and I'm one of the few people I suspect left in the world that's done Fortran. Um, so it's, it, um, you know, a, a range of things here. We also do quality assurance of other people's models. I think that was one of the key things from this peer review. So in government and uh, for a number of our private sector clients, they ask us to review their own models to check whether they work, to check whether that's the best way to model it. Um, again, in the engineer, on the transport side of things, we've had projects typically one to four months. We did actually work on the HS2 project in the past. That was a large piece of work and that was 18 months, probably one of our longest ever, but I've definitely overrun now. So thank you for listening. Great, thanks very much, Martin. Um, we've got around uh, 35 minutes for the Q&A session. So what we're going to do is for me to look through the list of questions you've submitted, and there are plenty of them, thank you very much. Um, if any of those we don't get around to answering, uh, we will put them to the uh, panelists afterwards and try and share those answers. Uh, so if the rest of the panelists would like to show themselves and unmute themselves, we can move into the questions. Some of these are going to be particular for uh, one of the presentations, others will be more general. Okay, first up, um, does CORDA recruit, only recruit UK nationals for security control purposes? Daniel, okay. Jason. Yep, I feel like I should have put this in the slide somewhere. Apologies for that. Um, short answer, no. However, we do require security clearance for CORDA roles. So security clearance is something that can be gained from, I think, nationals of multiple countries, but um, there's more information of that available on the website. But no, you don't have to be a UK national. 
I want to add, I think it's worth adding as well, Jason, that um, if you're offered a place, BA will do a security clearance on you. So it's not like you have to come when you apply with a security clearance. You, you can apply for the role. If you're accepted, they'll do a security clearance and you'll either pass or fail. Okay, Cosmin, Martin, anything to answer on that? Add, can I just add that for our work in central government, uh, the situation is potentially the same. The defence may carry slightly more um, emphasis on security clearance, but anything where you're working in central government, there's always the potential for um, security clearances. And uh, I mean, we have done work for uh, the Home Office where, again, similar sorts of security clearance uh, concerns arise. We would be in exactly the same position that it's being, a, it's being able to get that security clearance that's the important <clears throat> thing, not the nationality. Great, super. OK, next one up in terms of the voting is a general one. I'm in my second year uh, due to graduate in 2022. Do you have any opportunities or programmes for undergraduates? I guess that's in terms of placements or summer internships, that kind of thing. Who wants to take that one first? Uh, well, I um, like, but, no, you, no, you go ahead, Martin, it's OK. We answered the first one, you go ahead. Um, OK, well, we, I, I think we always say to people, um, drop us a line if you're interested. Um, I mean, at the moment, COVID makes so many things really, really complex, because I would have said that from our point of view, we, we have uh, certainly offered uh, internships of various lengths over the years. For us, it's part of the problem is not the, the individual's capability or availability, it's our availability to support the person correctly and fit them into the team. And so perversely, there are times when we're really busy and we would love an extra pair of hands and an internship is almost exactly the wrong thing for us to do because we don't have the time to support someone and get them up to speed with what we're doing. Um, and therefore, I don't, we, we don't say we've got a sort of a definite program for internships, but we, rec we, we, we encourage people to contact us about it. And if those opportunities are there, if it arrives at the right time, we'll certainly look to see what we can do. Um, but I do think that um, COVID is going to, certainly for us, and I suspect for many organisations, make it pretty difficult to know how you're going to handle this until the magical vaccine arrives in any day now, and then we're all okay again. Uh, I think it's that, it's, it is that, that that's the problem, certainly for ourselves. I, I suspect it's wider. Dan, Jason, are you adding anything to that? Um, yeah, so we'll add with Corda, we don't offer placements for internships, but if you are interested, um, connect with Jason or I on LinkedIn. We're always interested in, you know, what skills you can offer to BA Systems Corda. Um, the best places to keep up with that are on our LinkedIn or keeping an eye on the BA Systems Graduates um, portal with the, uh, where the website is. Um, where we have all of our hiring details. Okay, great. Anything from you, Cosmin? Yeah. Yeah, I guess at uh, so at Invenia we we have um, an internship program, but we tend to bias heavily towards masters or PhD students, and uh, the vast majority of our research team um, have PhDs. There are a few people who have a master's degree. Um, they were hired recently. In, um, but we tend to, due to the nature of our work, we tend to, um, like I said, heavily bias towards uh, those more academic careers at a PhD level, let's say. Great, thank you. And from the society point of view, we do get to hear of uh, these kind of opportunities from time to time, and we tend to share them where, where appropriate with our student members. So if you haven't already done so, sign up to, for the free membership. Okay, uh, next one is for, for Cosmin. Um, for Invenia, do you require candidates to have a background in machine learning or is this something that can be learned on the job? So that would depend a lot on the particular role that you're applying for. So for example, for our data scientists, research engineers and power system specialists, we don't require a machine learning background, though it's encouraged. And uh, we did hire two people in the last year who have masters in 
uh, power systems. Um, they're from Brazil. Um, so they had very limited machine learning background. They were exceptional on the power system side and they are sort of learning machine learning on the job. Uh, one of them recently went to a machine learning summer school, for example. So we do provide that kind of training. Obviously, if you're applying for the machine learning role, you do need that background. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next one up, a general one. Are candidates with an MSc or a PhD preferred? I would say in, in roles in quarter, there's a, not, a number of people in the office who certainly got master's degrees and PhDs. Um, we take account for that, certainly in the level that you may start in the organisation, uh, as well as compensation. But um, I think we're, we're open to all at the moment for our graduate scheme. Great. Yeah, I, I'd say very much the same that, that uh, I mean, it's, it's the key thing is uh, that numerate background, that numerate degree, uh, I think. Uh, I mean, sometimes a PhD is uh, an interesting, you know, there's an interesting thesis to read, but there's not a huge amount of directly relevant uh, information from it. You could argue, however, that uh, some of the more experiential master's courses are very good, particularly in preparing people for consultancy, because there, there will be roles in there that are parts of the course where there are those um, on-site um, projects the, 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 that you do. That's all good experience. So that certain masters, I think over the years we've looked at and thought they are very, very good preparation for the type of work we do, but not uniquely masters or uniquely PhD. So it's, it, yeah, it, it can help, but it doesn't, it doesn't always help. Yeah, I think I would largely echo that uh, as well. Um, having a master's or a PhD isn't a strict requirement, although uh, we do heavily bias towards those given the, the, the skills that we require. And we tend to bias more towards PhD, but we do have various master's students. And for example, if someone is applying with a master's and they have one, you know, one or two very interesting publications, we would take that into account. Or if they have uh, other exceptional skills or really interesting experience that fits with our work, we would take that into account as well. Great, thank you. Okay, next one up, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> next one up is directed at uh, Jason and Dan. Uh, can you give us an example of the methods you use to solve problems? Okay, um, yeah. So as an example of a problem that uh, I personally have solved probably around the time last year, and I won't give too much detail about it due to um, the area of the work, but I looked at a piece with um, F-35, the aircraft simulators. So we had a photo of one in our, in our pack and we were looking at optimizing their usage during busy periods, as well as exploring what factors individuals who are succeeding held. So as part of that work, we had a lot of data manipulation piece to kind of get loads of information together, combine it. So that was using tools such as SQL coding, Python and Alteryx. And then we wanted to use a simulation model to be able to support that and be able to give them an output analysis and something that we can run a few times to answer the first question about optimizing the use. But then there was also the element of now looking at factors of individuals who are using these simulators and for that we did a regression model and also used some other data association tools which I think was using Ultrix again and a bit of R to kind of delve into the detail there. Um, if, I want, if I wanted to add something I've, I've definitely focused more on like the statistical analysis side of stuff so um, quite often helping the business leads make better decisions within the company about say perhaps um, where they need to move people, but also looking into the individual level. So say the individual is, um, they've got a certain number of characteristics, seeing, okay, can we give this person a score based on how well they can move? Um, can they move cross country? Are they willing to move cross business? So that other people can have better um, skills and are, their careers are expanded upon. Um, and we give, we're satisfying what they want to do. Great, thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, one for everyone. 
Uh, how does your organization measure an individual's performance? Are there lots of targets? Who wants to go first? So I sure. Um, well, targets, no. I, I, I don't think um, from, our, for, from our organization's point of view, we don't give you a target at the start of the year that you must work this number of billable days and you must have solved uh, seven problems by the end of this week um, sort of thing. Uh, so I don't think that's um, uh, an issue uh, for, from our point of view. However, you've got to have ways of measuring people's performance. And therefore, from our point of view, um, we, you, you have um, regular appraisals. That's based on the internal assessment. So if you're a, 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 a new joiner to the company working in a team, then your project leader will assess your performance within that team. But we also try very hard to get feedback from all of our clients as to how individuals as well as projects have gone. And that will all uh, feature in uh, an assessment. So we are looking at people's performance. Obviously, if there are areas for improvement, those would be picked up and we would make sure that at the next appraisal, those are, those are checked to make sure that the improvements have been made. Um, at the same time, there's a more proactive element to it that as part of the appraisal process, you set targets for the next year. And some of that might be in terms of technical development. Some of it may be in the more broader uh, consultancy skills, getting involved in wider things. Um, some of it may be to do with um, uh, the individual's desire to move into a different type of project, either a different client area or a different technique. We would do our best to support that as it moves forward. And again, at the next appraisal, which initially they're six monthly, but move on to annual appraisal, you check to see how you're doing. But it is a full appraisal as well. There's the 360 side of it, because from the individual's point of view, there's that opportunity to say, has the company done what it should do to support individuals in meeting their requirements? Um, I am sure there are organisations out there that do set more formal targets, but uh, we certainly don't. Yeah, who's next up on that one? Uh, yeah, happy to ask that. So um, in, in super general terms, yeah, we have a performance review once a year with a six month kind of catch up on that. But um, something for us to add here is we the way we structure kind of within the organization, um, I have a career manager who is my line manager who would be supporting me um, and asking me questions about performance, making sure that I am going in the right direction and areas that I want to be doing. And that's kind of separate from the project managers and the other work that I would be doing. So we have lots of kind of connectivity to make sure that either we are doing the work that we kind of want to be doing, um, we're involved and we are being not necessarily checked for our performance, but we are able to have those conversations at any time with someone who's slightly separate from maybe the project work that we're doing. So we have kind of more avenues to go and have different conversations with, certainly when it comes to that. Great, thank you, Cosmin. Yeah, so uh, at Invenia, we, we also don't have any sort of strict performance targets for individuals. Uh, we have various sort of layers of feedback and performance reviews. So we have a more formal performance review every six months. So that would be with me, for example, for the research team. Uh, the vast majority of any individual researchers work, however, would be done on, on projects. So there would be uh, one-on-ones and review with the project lead, for example. So that's one area of review. Um, and uh, we, the, the researchers would also have one-on-one um, -on -one catch ups with me, uh, you know, every few weeks. Um, and in those discussions, we would talk about long-term goals for the, for the researcher uh, areas of professional development, their involvement in various aspects of like the bigger picture of research besides the individual projects. So participating in brainstorming sessions, um, coming up with new ideas, uh, proposing new projects, uh, solutions for open questions that we have. Um, we also look for um, sort of various notions of high quality work on the coding and research side. So how much people sort of dig into a problem and really understand it, um, things like that. Great, thank you. 
Uh, next one, I think, should be a quick one to answer for everyone, although it was specifically directed at uh, Jason and Dan, first of all. Is your graduate program open to early career researchers with postdoctoral experience? Um, yeah, yes, I would just add that certainly with um, having that level of experience is brilliant. And um, we would definitely be considering that for um, potentially maybe a slightly different entrance into the, uh, the career path at a different level. Um, yeah, but it would be fantastic certainly to have people coming in with that level of experience that they can apply. Martin Cosmin, anyone to? Yeah, I I I I, I would say um, pretty much the same. That that um, although a, a graduate recruitment exercise is, I guess, designed uh, on the basis that you're you're assuming that people are moving from straight from. Uh, higher education into employment, uh, there is certainly uh, no problem whatsoever if people have actually got some postdoc experience as well. That that I can't see why that would be a problem. It might be, um, as, as Jason was saying, actually that that it means that you're considered in a slightly different way, but um, uh, for for a, a slightly different starting position. But but uh, no, I don't think it's a problem. Um, but it's. But it's also not a disadvantage to not have it, if you see what I mean. Sure, thank you. Cosmin, anything to add to that? I think I would echo that. Um, postdoctoral candidates, uh, people who have, you know, PhD level experience or above, uh, we're very interested. Um, and we do have sort of more junior positions and more senior research positions. So that would depend on, on the experience of the person. Um, we're also very happy to have uh, people who, let's say, have a PhD and then maybe have worked uh, at another different non-academic research organization for a couple of years or worked in, in industry. Okay. Uh... Um, in the chat, we've got um, quite a few questions relating to specific degrees um, and subject areas. And so I'm wondering if we could just cover all of that in sort of one go um, and just say, are there any um, specific degrees that would be best when applying for your organization? Um, and also specific levels as well. Does it need to be an MSc or a PhD? Uh, yeah, would you like me to start? Or yeah, <laughs> yeah, please, please. Yeah, yeah it's for all. <laughs> so. well, I, I, I think it is that it's the numerate element of the degree that, that's, that's fundamental. Um, we, we have, I think, over the years taken a, a wide variety of actual degree titles, but it's always core for us that somebody has got the really solid grounding in the mathematical side of it. So I think, I'm trying to think of the, the, the we've had someone whose original degree was in law um, and had actually done some, uh, started their solicitor's training, um, had um, a, a change of mind and did a, a, a master's in OR at Warwick and applied to us, um, that, that was, uh, we felt they had very strong maths A-levels. They'd just done uh, a, a, a master's in OR, that was sufficient for us. That probably is sort of, if you like, at the extreme end of where we would, uh, we would go. Um, but usually if you've got that management science OR um, side to it, that's obviously going to be very attractive but we have many physicists, mathematicians, statisticians, uh, computer scientists for us, probably we wouldn't get to say computer science on its own, but computer science with an OR masters or something like that. Yep, that, that's, that, that's giving you the evidence that you've got the mathematical ability to, to undertake the sort of work. And then Jason, maybe next. Yeah, um, I think, Martin stole my word there. I was definitely going to focus on the uh, numerate was the key word for us, definitely. Um, something that I, I will say is kind of a hint in case any of you ever have an interview with us is um, we're very keen more so about the skills um, that you can say and you can apply and say that you've learned your degree because we want to be, be able to utilize them. Um, so certainly having passion to an area of something within your numerate degree is, is definitely really important to us and being able to 
delve into the detail and explain to us what you can do so we can work out how best to use it and how we can tailor the work and the projects that we're assigning and we're bidding on based on the skills that we have amongst the team. So we have people who have, again, maths, physics, chemistry backgrounds, um, all at different levels. Um, it's, it's a great spread and it's kind of what makes the environment um, really great in terms of what we're doing, what we're solving, because it really is, can be very different day to day. Um, for uh, for us, um, I think I would echo uh, the the other answers as well. Um, to give some examples of the kinds of degrees uh, people in the current research team have, uh, we have mathematicians, physicists, uh, people from various computational fields, computational chemistry, for example, uh, people who are able to do various kinds of mathematical modeling, simulations, uh, computer science, of course, um, optimization theory, um, generally things like that, um, data science, machine learning, of course. Great, hopefully that's helpful for people in the chat. Um, I've got a few people, so obviously you've talked a lot about OR, maths, and then the sciences. Um, I've got a few people asking about sort of IT, banking, things like that, you know, asking would you consider these numerate degrees? Um, if the answer there is no, what would you suggest that they, they could go on to do? Is it really just about pushing the skill sides, their skill sets, or is it is there a further study needed? I, I, I would echo that, that skill set piece. Certainly, if you've got a degree in IT and behind that you've been doing some work, which has been coding, maybe you've had a bit of a go using Python, that sort of area. That's fantastic. That would be really helpful for a work, piece of work I'm doing right now. So, um, yeah, but we, we definitely just kind of jump on whatever skills we have. And we're really interested to, with people who are passionate about using what they've learned. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I could give a sort of one size fits all answer. It very much depends. Uh, I mean, I saw uh, looking through uh, some of the Q&A myself, somebody talking about um, a biology degree. Um, if that was followed up with an OR Masters, I think that probably would constitute uh, potentially the, the, the level of numeracy that you want. Um, Psychology degrees, again, are something that in the past we've looked at because a psychology degree can have a, a wide range of modules within it and where somebody's choosing um, what they want to do. A, a psychology degree can be really quite statistical. There's a, there's a lot of statistical analysis potentially goes with that. If somebody had got that, that could be something that we say, oh, right. So th their, their preference, their direction is towards the numerate side. Probably in its own right, that's not enough for what we would look for. But if it was then followed up by a master's, for example, in OR, then I think that would uh, count as the sort of evidence that we'd be looking for. So I, th I don't think you can sort of say, these degrees are definitely in and these are definitely out. Well, there may be some. If, if somebody spent their life studying history, um, that probably doesn't give them that they it makes them very interesting people, but it doesn't actually give them the skill set to undertake the work that we're doing. If how, but there will be others that where it's definitely a grey area, and it will be down to what the individual has done within their course, the modules they've chosen, their preferences, their abilities in those areas. Plus, if you're looking at um, some sort of masters or PhD that's taking you further into the, the numerate side of things, that, that word, the, the first degree becomes less important. So I've been, um, I've been very focused in my comments on our, our the research team. But on, uh, if you go to the website, we also have various uh, role descriptions for our development and infrastructure teams. So that would be more on the computer science or IT side, let's say. Um, so we're, for example, we're very heavy users of Amazon Web Services and cloud computing. Um, so we're looking for people who have that kind of experience. Um, so solutions architecture, data engineering, um, database management, uh, people with sort of programming Python experience, uh, or uh, another programming language we use quite a lot is the Julia language. So those kinds of skills uh, would be great for those other, other roles as well. Great, okay. Uh, a more general one this time. Uh, what would be the single most important thing you would advise any graduate considering applying for a role with your organization to do? 
who wants to uh, challenge? Be bold. So um, I, I would say that the most important thing to apply would be to have confidence in your own, um, in your skills, because uh, having been to university and studied and to complete the qualification that you're doing requires skills, it requires a lot of work, and we, we respect that. And certainly coming into a, a role within BA Corda, we want you to get involved in the thing straight away. That we, we want people to be confident and bold about what they've done and to really go in and show that they have an aptitude to be able to use that. So I think what the thing to do, because I don't think I've quite answered the question, but is to have that mindset and really appreciate what you've actually done and how you've got here and use that. Uh, on our end, I think um, to give a maybe specific example for various roles, one thing that we, we uh, sort of weigh heavy, very heavily, one thing we look for is the ability to sort of work on independent projects. So for example, many of our development applicants or research applicants will have a GitHub page where they've you know, explored some machine learning model on some data set or done some data science work that they've then published publicly, um, where they, they can sort of show their ability to dive into a problem, to analyze it carefully, to think critically, to, to write clearly and precisely. Um, so I really recommend to people to have that sort of uh, public profile on GitHub or published papers or things like that. Okay, well, I'd, I'd say just from a sort of consultancy point of view, one of the things I always encourage people to think about is, do they really want to be a consultant? Um, because there are many OR jobs out there where um, you're working essentially uh, in, in your comfort zone, uh, because what you, not necessarily technical comfort zone, you may be challenging yourself, but if in your life you like to have an, uh, the ability to plan ahead, to say, oh, I always like on a Tuesday, I've got, um, I've got band practice on a Tuesday, I need to be able to do that. Um, a company like ours would always do its best to try and make sure that you get the right balance between the work and the lifestyle. But in consultancy, your customers do expect you to be able to deliver what they want when they want it and where they want it and therefore it doesn't suit everybody so think carefully about what you want to do is whether what we want to do is OR or consultancy because th there are demands in consultancy I think that um, are different to if you work in the OR group or business analysis group or whatever it might be called of a large organization you're probably in a fixed location you've probably got a far more um, regular diary so consultancy i'm not trying to make it sound as though it's all jet set and high pressure and things like that because it most definitely isn't but it does have moments where it puts demands on your flexibility and willingness ability and willingness to be flexible so do think carefully about whether that's really what you want Okay, a related question to, to that then, uh, which was specifically for, for uh, Dan and Jason, but can be answered by everyone. What percentage of your time do you travel to clients pre-pandemic? Yeah, I was going to say, because right now it's a zero. Um, <laughs> certainly, at the beginning of this year, I was doing two days a week in Smith Naval Base, so I would stay overnight. Oh, three days, three days some week, two days another week, and then I'd be working the rest of the time at office in Farnborough. So it's it's quite sp spread out sometimes, depending on the project work that you're doing. Certainly, you can say you, you want to go out and be in different sites all the time, and we can try our best to try and map that out for you. Um, we also have a cap, a corporate air travel from um, our office in Farnborough to our um, aerodrome in Wharton. So a lot of times people take the um, company flight up to the north for a, for a few meetings, then come back down in the in the evening. Um, so we definitely have a lot of flexibility, but roughly, if you're doing say three different projects, you could expect to be off site one day a week, I would imagine. But that that's super rough, and you'd, you'd find some weeks that you're just working in the office the whole time because you're building a process, and then other weeks you're completely on site with the customer. So it's it's very varied, but it's certainly something that you can adapt and change to make it the way that you want to work. I think also it's worth adding, it's definitely um, 
depend it's more dependent I, I suppose on the project and the customers demands if they want to meet in person you meet in person um, if they want if um, if you think as a team it's best that you present your findings to them directly or over Skype um, that plays a big factor into it yeah I mean I I, I would sort of echo that 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 um, I would have said probably on average pre-COVID uh, people would in, in Hartley McMaster projects would spend approximately and this is very rough 60% of their time in the office 40% of their time out on site but it's not it's not smooth like that there will be times where you've had several months working on a client site and sometimes those are just not commutable uh, sadly we don't have a corporate jet uh, I'm jealous. I'm very jealous of Gorda, but we don't we don't have a corporate jet, and therefore uh, and we we've had we at one stage had a lot of work for a client in Leeds and another client in Bradford, and we just had people had to uh, spend their working week there, uh, and say so it's not ideal, but it's it people understood that that was part of the requirement of the job. But that that's to say that you'll then have a block of a year where you're on projects based back in the office. So it's, it's not a regular pattern, but it's, it's also not all of your time out on site. Rosmin, anything to add to that or are your guys based pretty much in the office all the time? Um, I think um, we, we tend to, yeah, we, we are essentially based in the office. We don't interact, most of the research team don't interact with, with clients, for example. Um, within our research projects, the, the workflow is very collaborative. So people will be you know, at a whiteboard discussing um, in meetings, maybe uh, an hour or two a day. Um, in the last few months, you know, everything's obviously been online um, and we found that works reasonably well. Um, our projects are running just as smoothly. Um, we do also attend conferences every, uh, maybe a couple of times a year, depending on the, on the researcher. So maybe we would travel for those. Um, Great, thank you. Right, I think we've run out of time for more questions. There are still some unanswered. Yeah, uh, we'll um, we'll make sure that they um, they do get answered um, after after the session. Um, what well, once we've once we've finished with today? Um, yeah, just looking through um, the Q and A. I don't think there's any quick questions except uh, what does CORDA stand for? Yeah doesn't stand for anything anymore. I don't think we don't have to use it, but it was Center for Operational Research and Decision Analytics. Yeah, so there is OR in it. Yes. Um, just gonna share my screen now. Hope you can all see that. Um, just as a uh, reminder. So as your next steps, just for the closing out of this session, um, please take these last few minutes to sign up uh, as a member if you haven't already. Um, and also to bag one of our few remaining one-to-one -one sessions with our exhibitors, which take in place on Thursday. Um, if you have already booked your one-to-ones, um, we would encourage you to make sure your bookings are up to date. Um, if there is an exhibitor that you've booked with and they've managed to answer your questions in this session, um, it would be really great if you could cancel that so that another student will be able to, uh, to take that slot. Um, but yeah, thank you to all the exhibitors in this session and hopefully we'll be seeing all these students at the next session, which is starting at 12. Um, and also just for students as well, um, please do make sure to click through your delegate bags uh, and download it. It was sent to you this morning. Um, there's lots more information about uh, all of these exhibitors, in, including BA Systems, uh, Invenia Labs and Hartley McMaster as well. Um, and uh, there will be contact information on uh, on those as well. So if you do have uh, any other questions, um, please do get in touch uh, via that as well. Yeah, Great. Well, thank, thank you to the OR Society for organising this as well. Thank you, Martin. I didn't say at the start uh, we we're into our 20-something year of this, so it's been uh, going for a long time. All this is our first one that we've done online. So just to thank everybody once again and a reminder that we're restarting with the sec second session with another four uh, exhibitors. Um, I think we had a good range of uh, things in this morning's uh, talks and that will be further extended in the two sessions that we've got this afternoon. So do come back 
and hear a bit more uh, and some different uh, options for future careers in OR and analytics. Okay, thanks everybody. See you soon.